When Suikoden launched in December of 1995, it arrived early enough to become one of the very first sprawling JRPGs to land on the PlayStation, a platform which would later become a nest and haven for the genre as a whole. That timing was fortunate, seeing as powerhouses from Squaresoft were soon to follow. Funny enough, at the time, Suikoden was even considered by some to be a warm-up to games like Final Fantasy VII and Wild Arms. Due to being first to the party, so to speak, it sold relatively well, meriting a sequel in the eyes of the higher-ups at Konami. So Yoshitaka Moriyama, the series creator, got to work thinking about where the series should go next. For years, it has been commonly believed that Moriyama wrote the story for Suikoden 2 before development on the first game ever began. As the rumor tells it, it was actually conceived while he was working on a game for Konami's own handheld console, which was cancelled long before it had the chance to hit the market. I spoke more on that project in my Suikoden 1 retrospective, and you can find a link to that video in the description, but according to a number of prominent game publications, the story for the project was indeed the story of Suikoden 2, with one magazine claiming that the names for the characters were Ryu and Jowie even back then. They also claimed that after the game was cancelled, Moriyama decided to write a prequel story in order to gain the experience he felt he lacked before returning to the story he really wanted to tell. This isn't actually how it happened. During the course of my research, I found some conflicting information regarding this rumor, and decided to reach out to Mr. Moriyama personally for clarification. This is what he told me. The RPG I was developing before Suikoden was for the mobile game device planned by Konami itself. The content of the game was primarily focused on changing classes. At that stage, the number of characters appearing in the game was similar to a normal RPG, and the concept of a game like Suikoden, in which a large number of characters appear, was not in our minds then. This story had absolutely no connection with Suikoden, and when Konami's mobile game device project was cancelled, development on this RPG was simultaneously cancelled, and the story was completely abandoned. Development on that game came to a close primarily because Konami caught wind of the PlayStation, and decided it would be wiser to get in early with a large-scale RPG for Sony's console. Moriyama and the other developers at the company, including Juko Kawano, Suikoden's character designer, were given a choice between five options on which type of game they would like to make. I don't like either baseball or car games, so Junko and I chose to do one of the RPGs, but if I'd had a chance to do a shoot 'em up, I would have chosen that instead. It was at this time that the concept for Suikoden was discussed and decided on. Moriyama wanted to make a game with a large number of supporting characters, like the manga he was reading at the time, but didn't think his boss would understand those references being an older man. For this reason, he referenced Shui Hu Zuan, Suikoden in Japanese and Water Margin in English, which is a classic piece of Chinese literature in which 108 bandits come together to resist the government. I personally had been interested in Chinese classical literature, but at the time, I simply imagined the game to be like a manga with a large number of nearly main characters, such as Captain Tsubasa or Saint Seiya. However, when it came time to do a presentation for the Konami executives, I presented the idea of Suikoden as an easy way to understand the concept. Suikoden, exclaimed my boss, an RPG with 108 characters, I love it, run with it. At first I thought about saying that that wasn't exactly what I meant, but I let it be. Later, I regretted that I didn't explain what Captain Tsubasa was anyway. When I asked Moriyama whether Suikoden 1 had been written as a prequel to the story he was really looking to tell in Suikoden 2, something I've heard other fans repeat quite frequently, he told me the following. I don't think of a game scenario as an isolated story independent from other parts, but as something that dovetails with the game system. What I wrote in conjunction with the game system, after the selling point for this project had been decided on, is the scenario for Suikoden, and at that time, I had not thought at all about what the Suikoden 2 scenario would be. The story for Suikoden 2 was conceived after Suikoden 1. During the course of the first game's development, Moriyama had chosen to stick with sprite-based art rather than building the game in 3D, because in 1994, he simply wasn't impressed by early tests demonstrating the possibilities of the new technology. The early polygon tests I saw were not impressive, I think the technology was still too young. The 3D models didn't feel like people, they were too expressionless. We chose to make a pixel-based game instead because we would be better able to express the characters and give them more soul. However, once it was time to move forward with a sequel, 
PlayStation games were beginning to push the boundaries of what could be accomplished with 3D graphics, with contemporaries like Final Fantasy setting the standard for what players would expect from RPGs moving forward. However, given the smaller budget Konami could allocate to the project, Moriyama felt he had a hard choice ahead of him. Upon examining the feedback from fans of the first title, Moriyama decided that the majority of the most passionate players seemed drawn to Suikoden's story and world above anything else. We noticed that players really loved the world and characters we had created. All the letters we got, all the responses, were about the story and the world it took place in. People got immersed in our universe and were spellbound by the characters we filled it with. Once we realized that we could only afford to either develop better graphics or develop Suikoden's world more, the choice was obvious. We chose the world. This feedback was key in closing the door on that decision. And though there might have been some concern that Suikoden 2 wouldn't hold up visually to what other developers were doing on the platform, Moriyama, at least, believed that moving forward with sprite art would sufficiently meet fans' expectations and also give him and his team the time and freedom needed to further develop a world and story that would captivate their audience. And what a story it turned out to be. It would be an understatement to say that Suikoden 2's story is beloved. In the forums and comment sections I've visited, it's spoken of with an adoration and enthusiasm that places it at the very top of many of these fans' all-time favorite game lists. There's no doubt that the tone and depth of emotion Moriyama was looking to evoke was elevated to an all-new level with this game, aspiring for a tragic and sentimental tone that leaves a long-lasting influence. The opening scenario of the game hits you with this atmosphere right from the get-go, where best friends Ryu and Jowi are returning to their home country of Highland after a long war with the city-states of Jouston. In a coup set up by Highland's prince Luca Blight to end peace talks and reignite the war, our main character's youth brigade is ambushed and slaughtered. Barely managing to escape with their lives, Ryu and Jowi become separated, and in the opening credit sequence that follows, we see memories of their past play on the screen. This moment is punctuated with a beautiful piano composition, giving us a glimpse into the kind of emotional journey we're set to embark on. It is perhaps one of the most brilliant opening sequences of any game I've ever played. Suikoden 2 is at its best when it's focused on this personal journey of childhood friends, more so than on the plot of building an army to resist Highland. There are so many scenes which touch on how the horrors of war affect those forced to endure them, especially children, and how that instability and uncertainty changes their temperament. In order for me to discuss this in greater depth, it'll be necessary for me to dive into spoiler territory. So if you wish to play the game first without knowing these plot points, skip ahead to the timecode posted on the screen. In this story, Jowie stands as the best example. Through the early parts of the game, the main characters are continually forced to flee from the Highland army as it ravages the countryside, all in blind pursuit of Luca Blight's psychotic revenge. As this is going on, Jowie becomes increasingly obsessed with obtaining power, and soon he and Ryu are led to a cavern where two of the world's 27 true runes are kept. These relics contain unique powers which are tied to the creation of the universe, and throughout the Suikoden series, these runes engage in an eternal struggle between chaos and order. In this case, Jowi is drawn to the Black Sword rune, which contains devastating offensive powers, and Ryu is drawn to the Bright Shield rune, which counterbalances the Black Sword rune with potent defensive magic. At first, Jowi's desire to use his rune comes from the desperate need to protect those he loves, but over time, it changes him, and at the center of the game's core conflict, is this struggle between close friends. Ryu and Jowie each want to involve themselves in the shaping of the future of these warring countries, 
but disagree on how they should proceed. This leads them to stand on opposing sides of the war and, as you can imagine, creates a lot of heartache along the way. This division between the main characters is spurred by the demented ambitions of the game's villain, Luca Blight, considered by many to be among the most menacing villains of any JRPG. While his backstory isn't explored in depth, per se, the signs and insinuations we do get hint at a truly sinister past, which fully unhinged an already unstable mind. This character left a forcible impression on players with his unpredictable nature and boundless cruelty, leaving them unsettled every time he appeared on screen. This adds a great level of tension and urgency to the plot and gives believable motivation to Jowie's choice to pursue a different path to taking Luca down. When asked what his favorite part of the entire Suikoden series was, Moriyama's answer was simple, Luca Blight's death. Indeed, for those who have played Suikoden 2, this scene and the boss battle which comes at its tail end are perhaps the most lauded and memorable portions of the entire game. After receiving a tip on the Highland Army's movements, the player's army sets an ambush for the lunatic prince, and after cornering him on the battlefield, engages in a three-part boss battle in which Luca unleashes his full wrath. Once this difficult fight is eventually won, the ensuing scene sees this man who had served as such a psychopathic force of nature finally brought down, and the relief this brings in light of the atrocities he's committed is merely one of a handful of moments this game presents which successfully delivers the impact promised in the game's introductory sequence. It's moments like this which have lasted with players for their entire lives and which easily justify a playthrough for those who have never had the chance. The English localization, as was common in those days, can be a bit rough and sometimes undermines the dramatic gravitas. To be fair to the localization team though, it's really important to share the difficulties they faced in translating Japanese games back in those days. In many cases, they were working through an inordinate amount of text in just a matter of weeks, and often with minimal communication with the game's director. Under these constraints, it was almost impossible to do exceptional work in the given time frame. In a NeoGAF forum back in 2014, one of the translators gave a glimpse into how confusing the process was. I'm the guy who struggled with two of my compatriots, Casey Lowe and Jeremy Blaustein, to make some sense of the mess that was sweeped into his script in the format Konami delivered. I had already played the game for 90 plus hours and was confused. We were delivered the script among code with no indication as to who was speaking. The text was bunched together based on location. The solution? Play the game multiple times, searching as we did so for strings to gather context. We did our best. The main draw to Suikoden, though, the hallmark feature which makes it unique to other JRPGs, is the collecting of the 108 Stars of Destiny, and that is as true here as it is in any other game in the series. For many players, the gameplay loop which hooked them into Suikoden was reaching a new area, finding and recruiting the new characters found there, seeing the army grow and base expand, then proceeding into the next area. There's a lot of exploration, side questing, and amusing minigames associated with this process, and it is in doing all this that much of the game's charm and uniqueness can be found. The developers also added some new features which made finding and recruiting characters a little easier than in the first game. In Suikoden 2, once you bring Richmond to your castle, he'll give you hints and tips on where to find certain characters and how to recruit them. This was a great touch, which gives players a greater incentive to hunt for 100% recruitment on their own rather than resorting to online FAQs. However, it's still easy to permanently miss characters who only appear early on in the game, which would require a restart if full completion is your goal. Similarly to the first game, the ending will change based on how many characters you've recruited, with the true ending only becoming available after recruiting every character in the game. The characters themselves are a rich blend of diverse personalities, as is often the case in anime and manga, which served as direct inspiration for the concept. This means that there will be a character for everyone, so to speak, someone who appeals to any player who picks up Suikoden 2. This was exactly as Moriyama intended it, and considering the player character is a silent protagonist, often the supporting characters outshine the main hero. One major change from the first game comes in how large-scale battle scenes are depicted. 
In Suikoden 1, major battles took the form of a rock-paper-scissors style minigame, and if you made the right selection, you'd take out a large portion of the enemy army. You could also use special units to sneak into the enemy base and discover what their next move would be, giving you an advantage on that turn. This system was entirely abandoned for Suikoden 2, replaced with a tactical style minigame reminiscent of other major strategy RPGs like Fire Emblem, Shining Force, or Landgrisser, putting the player in control of a number of units, each representing a brigade, to go up against an enemy army. For most people I've talked to, this was a welcome change, and on paper I'd have to agree. If we could get a traditional turn-based RPG combined with a tactical RPG for major battle sequences, that would be a home run. It should be noted though that for a great majority of these battles, the player doesn't have full command of all the allied units, usually only being able to move one or two of them. And additionally, these sequences serve mostly as vehicles for telling the story. It's rare to actually have a clear objective, and most have no failure state. In other words, you can't lose most of these battles. You just move the units around until the battle ends with a cutscene and moves on. Additionally, ground units can only move one tile at a time, while mounted units can only move two, which limits movement to the point where outmaneuvering your enemies isn't really a major factor in any of these battles. The battle system here functions identically to the first game, with only minor changes to inventory management. You can still bring six characters into your party, and each will be classified as a short-range, medium-range, or long-range attacker, which will dictate whether they should be placed in the front or back row. The auto battle feature makes getting through weak enemy mobs much quicker, and if your party is at a significantly higher level than the enemies, then the let go command will replace run, just like before. One thing I didn't mention in my review of Suikoden 1 though, is that if you bring a low level character into your party, then they will gain experience at a much faster rate than higher level characters, allowing you to bring them up to speed within just a couple of battles. This is not only a convenient feature, but a necessary one for a game with so many characters to recruit and level up. One thing that was majorly improved on, however, was the inventory system. In the first game, each character had their own inventory with a very limited number of slots, meaning you would fill up quickly and were constantly forced to make decisions about what to keep and what to let go of. In Suikoden 2, there's a shared inventory on top of each character's individual inventory, which gives the player a lot more room to work with. It's nothing like a Final Fantasy game, which has a near limitless inventory, and that means you'll still have to make use of the storage facility at the base to keep your inventory open, but it's without question much more forgiving here than in the first game. They've also allowed characters to equip more than one rune at a time, expanding on how you prepare your characters and use magic in battles. It's a simple change, but one which opens a few new possibilities that expand the battle system, offering a little more freedom than the first game did. Many players will note that both Suikoden 1 and 2 are fairly easy games, with maybe one or two bosses putting up a real fight for the player. I mentioned this a bit in my video on the first game, but this was definitely an intentional choice for Moriyama, who cites Black Onyx as his reason for balancing the games the way he did. I remembered when I got Black Onyx from my parents. The difficulty of the game made me incredibly frustrated. Some parts took me months to complete. In the last cave, the player needs to pass through a series of doors in the exact right order, but without any clues whatsoever how he should go about it. Personally, I wanted to make a relatively easy game that anyone could beat, and that became a driving force during development. Rather than making a complex game system, I wanted to capture people with a dramatic story. It's definitely true that Suikoden is more about appreciating the journey. You're meant to simply enjoy the process of exploring the world, meeting all the wonderful characters, and expanding your army and base. There's no doubt that Moriyama was more focused on those aspects than on creating a tactically sound battle system which requires preparing just the right way. He wanted to create a smooth experience for players to relax with rather than be challenged by, and to that end he succeeded. For the most part the game progresses at a steady pace, and the difficulty remains consistent, which makes the spike in the battle against Luca Blight all the more urgent and full of tension when the time comes. The style of the sprite art and character portraits also saw an update, with animation receiving a touch of polish that pushed it beyond what the first game was able to accomplish. One thing that stands out in that regard with Suikoden 2 is the amount of unique sprites that were made, 
sprites which were drawn specifically for the scene in which they appear. In most JRPGs from this era, the developers created a palette of sprite animations to express a range of emotions. Maybe the head would drop to indicate the character was depressed or disappointed. Perhaps the eyes would bug out and the mouth would open wide to indicate surprise. Usually, a handful of these kinds of gestures were created to be used whenever the context called for them in the event scripting, allowing the planners to pull from the artist's palette whenever necessary. In Suikoden 2, it's actually extremely impressive how often you'll see a unique sprite, used once and only once specifically for the emotion being expressed in that particular scene. You would then never see that sprite again, which gives the cutscenes in this game a certain attention to detail rarely seen in 2D games like this, adding to this game's unique charm and appeal. The music was once again composed by Miki Higashino, who composed all but seven of the 105 tracks which appear on the OST, while the remainder were tackled by Keiko Fukami and Tapi Iwase. For all intents and purposes, Suikoden 2 was the last game soundtrack she would compose. After working at Konami for 15 years and leaving an amazing but relatively underappreciated legacy behind, she decided it was time to prioritize her personal life and start a family. One day, I felt like the goddess of music was whispering in my ear, saying, isn't it time to put down that burden? You've done so well. If you're gonna quit, now's your only chance, you know. I'm the type to pour everything into my work, so I was never able to build a stable personal life. Physically, this had taken its toll, and I needed to reset everything for the time being. I had a definite vision of building a home and becoming a mother, and after thinking about the best way to accomplish that, I left Konami. To those around me, it might have seemed like a snap decision, but to trust my feelings then was the wisest decision that I've ever made. The more research I do into the development history of these classic games I grew up with, the more I see how the figures behind the scenes suffered massively during the production process, working ungodly hours to hit their deadlines. It seems there really isn't any exception, and that was the case for Higashino as well. For better or worse, Suikoden 2 is my representative work. It was such a large project. I know it was this way because they didn't have the budget for more people, but looking back on it seems really reckless. We had no personal lives for months. I don't think I would ever work that way now. It would be faster and make more sense to split the duties amongst several people. But I experienced all sorts of things as a result, and I was able to get through this roughest part of my career. Because I put all the effort I could into my work, I am completely satisfied with the result. In 2001, she left Konami and never returned to full-time composing. While contributing to a few projects here and there, including a collaboration with Yasunori Mitsuda on 10,000 Bullets, known as Sukiyo Nisaruba in Japan, raising her child and finding a more balanced life is now her current priority. The music of Suikoden 2 is as diversified and distinct as the first games, but this time around is a great deal more expansive. With more towns and a longer story comes the need for more music, and it's really quite impressive how consistent the quality of the OST remains throughout. Suikoden 2 was on an even larger scale than its predecessor, as I knew the moment I laid eyes on its thick scenario. As there was a clear increase in the number of cities and towns, I felt there was a need for a more methodical compositional process. I would begin by looking at all the maps I'd received and think about what kind of people would live in each area and what kind of culture they would have, what kind of climate and industry would there be. Then I would decide on Celtic and early music here with Spanish music and Fado in the city to the south. Middle Eastern music over there, for the Ninja Village, Japanese music of course, and so on for each area. You enter a city, and it's as if you can hear the music that would actually be performed there. Isn't it a bit like taking the player on a journey around the world? This kind of variety of world styles can be clearly heard throughout the game world, and offers a wealth of personality to each region and town, which is exactly what this kind of RPG calls for. The sheer size of the OST was virtually unprecedented for the time as well, with perhaps Breath of Fire 3 being its only rival on that account. 
While even the most sprawling RPGs of the 90s usually contained between 50 and 80 tracks, many like Xenogears and Grandia had far fewer, so for Higashino to pull off nearly 100 tracks by herself is a pretty incredible feat, especially considering almost all the music is wonderful. It even features a fully orchestrated opening theme, performed by the Warsaw Philharmonic Orchestra, another piece which sets the stage for the deeper thematic contents Weekend 2 explores. The development process also took its toll on Moriyama. In my final question to him, I asked if he would share any of his personal struggles while working on Suikoden 2 to help us understand just how much effort and passion went into creating such a classic game. This was his response. Regarding Suikoden 2, Suikoden had succeeded, so the development scale got bigger, but the development structure itself was not very mature, so it turned out that I had to write almost all of the text myself. In particular, I remember staying in the office and sleeping there for months while I worked on writing the huge volume of lines for NPC townspeople, which changed depending on the scenario as the number of characters grew. When writing the lines for a huge number of NPCs, I would try to embody the characters, and I remember in the middle of the night being tired and starting to actually hear different voices like I was hallucinating. I think I probably lost several years off my life due to that project. Hearing personal stories like these, at least for me, always brings a greater sense of appreciation for the games that served as formative experiences for many of us. Suikoden 2 certainly fits that bill and sits comfortably alongside the now legendary library of amazing PS1 JRPGs. With its epic but sentimental wartime story, incredibly emotional scenes, enormous cast of memorable characters, detailed art, and gorgeous soundtrack, it is without question a game that all enthusiasts of the genre should play at least once. I'd like to give special thanks to community members Zenmens and Hion for their invaluable help with translating my emails back and forth with Moriyama for this review. If you'd like to see more retrospectives like this for some of your favorite games, please subscribe and support us on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again soon.